and welcome to one of the several SIB sessions. We thank you for choosing this session. I know there's one going on right now about India, and there was one earlier this morning. So thank you for your interest in this session. We're excited to talk to you about the details, a little bit more about the complex anatomy behind these transactions, of which we've had four launched to date. Um, and so would just love, before we get started, how many of you all in the audience feel like at this point, given the SOCAPs, given all of these sessions on social impact bonds, how many of you feel like you could explain to somebody what a social impact bond is at this point? All right. How about our panelists? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, today we hope to not do the 101 conversation at this point. We think that's been done. Um, and if I can get the PowerPoint up, we hope to spend just 30 seconds, get everybody on the same page, and then to show you a little bit, put up a slide about the four transactions that are here to date, but then really to turn it over to the panelists to talk about what we don't often get to talk about in panels, which are the, the challenges, the major inflection points, and the lessons learned as the roles of the investor, the intermediary, government, and provider um, really sort of play out in these actual transactions. So I will be your moderator. I'm Caroline Whistler, uh, co-founder and partner at Third Sector Capital Partners. We're a nonprofit intermediary, if you will, but really we provide advisory services, uh, consulting to governments and providers to both to figure out the feasibility of transactions as well as to structure the financing around them. So I will be moderating through the discussion and we have several other panelists that will be talking about their different roles. Gary Graves, who's the COO of Santa Clara County and the county's been exploring pay for success. We've got a blank space for Andy Phillips from Goldman Sachs, who's stuck in traffic, but she's going to be flying in at any moment. Um, Bill Heiser, who is the California Director of Center for Employment Opportunities, a service provider involved in the transaction. Eileen Neely, the, di the Director of Capital Innovation from Living Cities and Amy Olson, a lawyer with Ropes and Gray. So excited to get started and then we'll have each of the panelists talk a little bit about their lessons learned, their roles in these projects, ask about you know, how, moving forward, what are the chances that we can actually make social impact bonds part of the way that governments do business and what will it take to make those enduring? Um, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. So at any point, please save your questions for the end. But just for the real quick 101, if you will, just so we're all on the same page, we've got two major innovations going on, pay for success and social impact financing. Pay for success is essentially the government, a new type of performance-based contracting where government only pays once they see results. It's a little different from performance-based contracting you may know because it raises the bar on evaluation. So really focusing on rigorous evaluation and outcomes, giving providers more room and flexibility on the service delivery side, so not prescribing exactly what services, but giving more flexibility there. And then also having government only pay at the end of an engagement versus incrementally along the way. Most of the projects we've seen so far have government actually withholding payments to the very end. So type of performance-based contracting, but a little different. And since government's holding back all of those dollars, we've got a financing need that happens. And we call that social impact finance, or you, that's where the social impact bond comes in. So the social impact bond is really the financing that's bridging that timing gap between when a government initiates that pay for success contract and when they actually pay for those results. So that's just so we're all on the same page. Uh, there are four current projects that you may hear referenced by our panelists. Uh, the first is in New York, was in New York City. The second in Salt Lake City. Third in New York State. And fourth in the state of Massachusetts. And you can feel free to ask questions about any of those. But um, wanted to really sort of turn it over to the panelists at this point to talk about their various roles across these projects um, and to reference them and then we can get into some details as well as, um, as the project goes on. And welcome Andy, <laughs> great to see you. <laughs> 
Um, and actually, if you, if you don't mind, so we've done the 101, and we were planning on starting, really just turning it over to the panelists, having each of you talk about what has been your role, either in the four transactions that's up, that are up here, or in other pay for success developments, and um, what have been some of your lessons learned and key inflection points here. So Andy, if you don't mind, I know you just walked in, um, but would, from the funder perspective, um, how have the roles of, you know, Goldman has been involved in three of these transactions at this point. How has your role at Goldman as an investor evolved and how are you seeing the roles of other funders evolve in pay for success transactions? Okay. Um, hi, everybody, and I am so sorry for being late. I got trapped in San Francisco traffic, which I underestimated. Um, right, I should have expected it was as bad here as it is at home. So, um, so first, by way of a just brief introduction, I think in terms of our role in social impact bonds as a firm, it's important to understand where I sit in Goldman Sachs because Oftentimes when people think of social impact investing, Goldman Sachs is not really the name that jumps to mind very quickly. Um, and so I sit in a team at Goldman called the Urban Investment Group. That has been a business at the firm for about a dozen years, uh, investing the firm's capital, and now I'm really proud to say we're also investing client capital through our newly launched social impact fund, um, which is now nearing $150 million of client capital. Um, we make investments that are double bottom line investments, so a financial return and a social impact, something we all in this room uh, know a lot about. Um, as a team, our primary investing strategy has historically focused on real estate and hard assets. Um, but we have always viewed our role as investors as to really think about how you can use private capital to address pressing social challenges. And so um, when I got a call from Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, Linda Gibbs from the city of New York, and she said to me, hey, we've got an idea. Have you heard about these social impact bonds? And after we finished the part of the conversation where I said, Linda, those are not bonds, and we got through that piece of business, um, and she said, are you guys interested in taking a look? Um, it really made a lot of sense to me and to our team. Wow. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, that really, when you think, when you step back from a lot of the discussions about social impact bonds, really what we're talking about is providing working capital to typically nonprofits to expand or replicate their services, right? And that is combined with government doing business differently, um, and instead of reimbursing costs to the organizations that they contract for services, instead paying for outcome. And that when you put those two powerful things together, you get something that someone calls social impact bonds, or what I call social impact not a bonds. <laughs> um, you know, to sort of then go back from the high level, I think we've learned a lot as a team over the last two years in terms of what does it really take to execute on these transactions. And um, I, I think sort of on a high level, I'd sort of identify a, a, a couple key facts. One is, uh, I would say sort of globally, there is tremendous interest in leveraging this new tool that we think is really, really exciting. The challenge really is how do you get from that level of interest on the part of government, on the part of nonprofits, and on the part of investors to make these types of investments and actually execute on transactions. And something we're very mindful of as we continue to pr pursue these type of investments is how do we do it in a way that moves us toward uh, scalability? and replicability and oh my gosh down the road one day can we really actually legitimately call these bonds and I'm cautiously optimistic that we can get to that but also really believe that the way we're going to get there is by doing more deals and focusing on strategies that are really um, for lack of a better term, executable. Um, some of that for us on a very practical basis is identifying transactions um, that have simple pay for success structures. Um, I find when we're doing these deals that you often want to say, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, 
there's a real focus on only paying based on randomized controlled trials and the sort of results of those trials, we think there are simpler payment mechanisms. Um, and for example, in our Utah transaction, we pay based on kids that are pre-identified as high risk doing well in school rather than waiting for a long-term evaluation. So that's a little bit about our role, I hope, and sort of what we're thinking about of the challenges, but now I'll pass it along. And one quick follow-up question for you, Andy and Eileen, also jump in. Um, as an investor, one of your major considerations is the risk of these transactions. How has your perspective on the risk of a particular deal changed or evolved, or what do you consider? Sure. That's a great question, and I would say we, when we think about the risk, and um, we really, I put it in three different buckets. And so the first bucket is always impact risk. And so what we're really doing is underwriting the transaction and saying, what is the likelihood that if you do this inter a given intervention, whether it's Roca's unbelievable program in Massachusetts or the amazing Granite Preschool curriculum in Salt Lake County, if we deliver that intervention, can we get ourselves comfortable that we'll get the impact we need to achieve the um, payment milestones and then repay our loan? And in order to analyze that risk, we really look at what is the data that exists, either published data, ideally, or current programmatic data that gets us comfortable. The second area we focus on is implementation risk. And really, that's like you would do with any other investment, which is, who is the management team? What are their systems in place for performance management? And again, going to the Roka example, Molly Baldwin and her team are superstars. Um, I would say the same of the Osborne Association and the folks doing early education in Utah. They are deeply committed, subject matter experts, and also have very strong systems for managing to their performance. So implementation risk is another area. The third area is appropriation risk, and that really depends on the jurisdiction. And really we're looking, what we're looking at there is how can we be sure that five years from now when the city of New York needs to pay, that they will actually honor that commitment. And that's been solved in a lot of different ways in different places, everything from setting up escrow accounts to in Massachusetts passing legislation to put the full faith and credit of Massachusetts behind it. The area that I think we've, I've learned that you have to focus on more is implementation. And when we think about implementation and Eileen and I were talking about this <laughs> recently, it's not just your principles. It's not just the team that's delivering the services. It's what else are they relying on in the social service system to be able to do what they need to do. And um, increasingly over time, what I would say is that has become a bigger and bigger um, area of focus of our underwriting. What I would say that has also led us to do in terms of doing this tra these transactions is ensure that we build flexibility into the deal at the outset because you don't know what you don't know and you don't know what's going to come up later on. And so there needs to be a mechanism for making tweaks over time. Thanks. Um, so I'm Eileen Neely, I'm with Living Cities, and we are um, an investor in both the Massachusetts transaction and the New York State transaction. Um, so um, like Andy, I would say the two areas that I really focused on when I underwrote both of those deals were the operational risk, what's the likelihood that the service provider can produce the outcomes, and the other was the appropriations risk. The piece that I really missed, and I think all of us missed in both those transactions, are um, how, do they, how do the participants get into the program? And, and that's where we've seen issues in all three of the um, justice recidivism deals, the New York City, the New York State, and Massachusetts, you think there's plenty of people in the justice system. We'll have no trouble getting people into the program. And, and we did uh, spend a lot of time in the underwriting on the um, uh, attrition. So once they're in the program, what's the likelihood that they're going to quit? You know, all these guys are going to want to quit, right? 
We didn't think about what it takes for the government systems to talk to the service provider systems and, and get them in place. And so now instead of thinking only about the how do you get people in is what's the what's the uh, way the business is being done today and how is that going to be different under the pay for success or social impact structure and and that thinking about it that way really helps to identify those change risks one of the one of the obvious ones is scale if they're serving 20 kids today and 400 kids tomorrow that's a serious risk but if they're recruiting their own participants today and under the SIB, the government is going to refer them very different structure and, and what happens there. So I think it's the how are things different under the SIB than business as usual. And Eileen, can you talk a little bit about, we heard from Andy the types of risks that are considered and you talked a little bit about the, um, the attrition and referral process. What else goes into these negotiations as an investor? Can you get, shed a little bit of light on the complex anatomy of those negotiations? What doesn't go into it? Um, I think one of the things that we're um, seeing and, and we're going to see, and, and Andy really introduced this um, and her team in the Massachusetts deal, which is shutdown risk and what happens if one of the parties decide that they no longer want to play. And we really talked about what happens when things aren't working. And so will the investors want to quit early or will the state want to quit early? But in the Peterborough deal in the UK, you know, the, the government decided that they weren't going to play anymore after and, and what, depending on, you know, I have never visited, I haven't talked to any of the participants there, I'm just outside um, reading the articles and the blogs and the people. And so there's some who say, oh, it's because it wasn't going well, and others are saying, oh, it was because it was going too well. Um, so whichever it is, they decided that they weren't going to do it, you know, they weren't going to go into the next cohort. So what does that mean to the investors? So I think that's a, a big risk to think about, not only for the investors, but the participants of the program. And I'm going to shake things up, but given that we are talking a little bit about contracting, Amy from Ropes and Gray, Amy was the main lawyer to do the to pull together the Massachusetts juvenile justice contract, which is the largest pay for success to date. Amy, do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like to not work from a template, and what sort of went in? What were the considerations <laughs> that went into pulling together this whole contract? Right, happy to. I'm Amy Olson, and, and um, I was pro bono counsel to Third Sector and their um, special purpose uh, vehicle, Youth Services Inc., which was the kind of conduit, um, financial conduit to, to all the various parties. Um, so they were the borrower under the finance uh, 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 funding agreements, and then the um, uh, the person who received payment under the pay for success contract and I was one of uh, ropes was one of many firms I think uh, all of Boston's best firms were involved in this transaction as well as excellent counsel um, Manat in in New York uh, um, and so it was really quite complex and it's so interesting when Andy was saying you don't know what you don't know and I think that um, I come from a private equity background and there, you know, it's a much more, uh, you know, it's been around a lot longer. Sponsors have been around a lot longer. You know, there's kind of people understand what's happening. And I think I, one of the biggest surprises to me was kind of along the lines of like over the course of the deal realizing this really only works for so long as everyone wants it to work, you know, and as long as they are flexible and, you know, figuring out what you don't know and, and, um, uh, and so it wasn't um, as much of kind of binary negotiations with, you know, us with the Commonwealth um, on the pay for success. I mean, obviously, the funding sources care deep, you know, care significantly about, you know, how is success measured. And I think Andy may have been the one best who understood. I remember being on one call where I'm like, this is, I've wandered into some kind of advanced statistics class and I know nothing. <laughs> but Andy was there, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because during, you know, there is no template and then also there's kind of 
shifting alignment of you know whose interests are kind of together. I think the funding sources and the borrowers' interests are aligned when you're talking about what is success, keeping it simple, keeping it measurable. Um, and then, you know, the Commonwealth in our instance or the, and the borrower, you know, interests are aligned when um, you're talking about, well, what do you have to do to get the money from the financing sources, you know, making it as easy as possible. And, and so, it, you know, that added to the complexity as well. So. Just so folks can get an idea, how many contracts were involved in Massachusetts? 27. 27. And ro just Ropes and Gray had over 1,100 hours of pro bono legal um, hours involved in this project. And so I think one of the things I've talked with Carolyn about, too, is I'm like, it has to get simpler. Like, you know, <laughs> 1,100. And I knew your counsel was really out here. No, I was going to make a comment. Yeah, yeah. So the one comment I would make on that that I think is the good news to that story, um, so we're fairly far down the line with another transaction, and what I will say is the legal piece has gotten simpler. And that to me is tremendously good news. Um, I think as people um, get up the learning curve, um, we're getting more comfort with it. And so there's not that same level of, oh my gosh, we're traveling in a land we've never been in. And so we've heard from investors, we've heard from the lawyers negotiating these transactions. At the end of the day, one of the major parties is government. Uh, Gary, COO of Santa Clara County, could you talk to us a little bit about what are the major considerations for governments that are thinking about getting in this space and your challenges with this process as you walk down the road? Good afternoon. Uh, again, Gary Graves from Santa Clara County. Uh, we've been involved in this process now for about two years. And actually, this was a concept that was brought to us by the community. There was a what was called a disruptive innovation grant from the Health Trust. It caught the attention of one of our Board of Supervisor members, and, and they asked us to take a look at it. And, and it was introduced as social impact bonds. And I looked at the word social impact bonds, and I'm saying, OK, they're going to ask us to issue bonds. So I immediately said, you know, I, th this really is, I was, I was very concerned about it. And, and as I, I learned more about it, um, it really became something that we became, of course, very interested in, and, and mostly for two reasons. Number one, it was an opportunity to really focus on outcomes, and that's something that government just has to do. It has to really focus more on making decisions that are based on facts and objective information so that good decisions can be made and they're less political. I know that may seem like an obvious thing, but obviously if you're in the world of government, that isn't always the way things work. And so to the extent to which we can move in that direction, I think is a really big advantage. Secondly, we saw it as an opportunity to bring some, some new capital into solving some of our most difficult problems. Uh, and so as a result, um, we move forward with this project and, and we're now focused on two uh, areas. Number one is homelessness and number two is acute mental health care. And we've been working with Caroline uh, over the last two years and we arrived at those two projects after a pretty lengthy uh, feasibility analysis or environmental scan because I can tell you that this is not a model that necessarily is going to work on every problem. And so you really have to be selective uh, and in some ways kind of look at areas where the delivery of service may be suboptimal, where, where you can in fact apply this outcome focus into really improving. Um, and that's where we came up with what uh, I would describe as kind of a dual path approach. Um, on the one hand, you know, the traditional pay for success is about really developing cashable savings that then can be used for your success payments. Uh, and what I realized, what in the case of homelessness, is that I really didn't think that we could generate cashable savings. And so, but homelessness is a very significant issue for us uh, in Santa Clara County. We have over 7,000 homeless on any given night. Uh, and so politically and, and also just from an overall perspective, it's, it's an issue that we feel like we have to do better. We have to make some progress on. So uh, we decided that we would actually put up the money as part of a general fund expense for the success payments for the homeless project. 
Uh, and, and so that's the one path. The other path on the, on the acute mental health side is really about uh, developing cashable savings. We think we can do that. Um, the, the reality that, I, that we're facing with trying to do two projects is, is the issue of the amount of time it's taking. Uh, you know, the amount of time that I'm putting into this and staff will obviously have existing jobs. Uh, our, our county council has just been amazing in the amount of time that, that uh, they have invested uh, because this is a very complex issue in terms of, you know, once you make your decision about where you want to really apply the pay for success concept, taking that to deal construction and putting all the pieces together is really important. Uh, and it really is something that you have to be willing to dedicate a lot of time to. So that's something that as I talk to colleagues in government that they really have to be prepared to invest time uh, because that's really what it's gonna take because each situation is different and unique. And so, you know, I, I think it's true. You don't know what you don't know. And in each government, there's going to be more of that to, to be faced. And, and how you deal with that is going to be unique to your own situation. In several, in several cases, I've challenged Caroline to say, you know, there really isn't a model. This is so new. Let's do it differently in a way that's going to, you know, really be a way that's going to work in Santa Clara County. So obviously that aspect, the flexibility of it, um, is there, but obviously on the other side is the time it takes to really make it all work. And so we've just got to the point where we've selected a lead agency on the homeless and we're really heavily into the deal construction phase at this point. The mental health project is uh, a little bit behind, uh, but I'm happy to hear that uh, the legal side is becoming simpler. Uh, because that's really important to us uh, because, as I said, it really is a big dedication of time. But at the same time, you know, I believe that it, it's, uh, it's going to be worth it. I think that this is the beginning of really ch trying to change the way, you know, we focus on evaluation and outcomes and, and actually provide better service to the community. So, Gary, I think it's interesting you brought up that for the homelessness project, you're not looking so much at cost savings. And Andy and Eileen, as investors, they care, so they're also caring about appropriations risk. If you're not getting savings, how are you addressing the appropriations risk? Well, I, I think, you know, that's a question that doesn't have a, an easy answer. I mean, obviously, we can't bind the board in, in terms of making future decisions around appropriations. But at the same time, generally, the way that we budget, which is incrementally, that once something gets into the base and there's a base uh, investment in this particular purpose, something really dramatic would have to happen for that to be reversed. Uh, but, you know, clearly, um, from our perspective, um, you know, if something is a high enough priority, we do believe that the board will be there and willing to make that investment for the term of the contract, if you will. And in the, in the case of, of this homeless project, we're looking at a six year and over six years uh, of investing. So I'm confident that uh, the board understands, you know, what that obligation is. And uh, even though they haven't made the decision at this point, they did decide uh, to invest a million dollars in this budget to get us ready to, to fully implement the project. So I think their commitment is there. What I wanted to add is I want to say hats off to you for thinking about it that way, because I think that is, um, incredibly smart and incredibly forward thinking. You know, government buys services all the time and sometimes it doesn't have to be because you save money but because it's the right thing to do. So from my perspective as an investor, I think it's, you know, if we can contractually figure out the appropriation thing, I think that's great and I think it's really smart. So I'm thrilled to hear you say that. And, and I do want to um clear up something that I know was confusing to my credit committee, which is our payments as investors are not tied to the government savings, they're tied to the outcomes. And so the government savings calculation has been used in these four transactions to calculate for the government how much they're willing to pay per outcome, but it doesn't guarantee that those savings are going to actually materialize. And the fact that I'm paying for outcomes that the service provider can um, manage and um, affect and not 
some arbitrary government savings numbers that no one understands government budgeting anyway, we'd never be able to find. And Eileen, can you talk a little bit about how, if, we're, if governments aren't paying out of savings and you're actually pricing outcomes with pay for success, how are you seeing, how are your investor committees getting comfortable with the appropriations and how government is promising and making that commitment to pay? Well, Andy mentioned, um, certainly Massachusetts set up the gold standard, um, which is they pledge their general obligation or their full faith and credit. And so if, they, if the outcomes are produced and they don't pay, it actually impacts their credit rating. Um, and so all their other you know, billions of dollars of um, indebtedness would be impacted. So there, you know, there's a pretty good chance they're not going to default on a $30 million obligation. Uh, you know, so, so that's the gold standard. Um, the way that it was done in New York State, um, where they did not pledge their GEO, basically they do a two-year appropriation. And so they appropriate for the full amount of the outcome payment um, every year. And that appropriation is good for two years. And so in any given year, um, if they don't appropriate, then they start to do that wind down, that exit, um, that exit risk that I talked about. So it's an early, early threshold. So those are the two I know. And then in Cuyahoga, we just had a conversation. And um, basically, they can't pledge their GO. Um, but they recognize their, if, if they would default, on, they view this as a multi-year contract and they enter into multi-year contracts all the time and they view it as if they default on their pay for success multi-year contract, all their other multi-year contracts would be in jeopardy. And so when they you know, talk about it, they're like, can you imagine if we couldn't do a multi-year contract for 911 services? And so... That's pretty compelling from an appropriations risk standpoint. It's certainly not perfect. There's not money sitting there. Um, but given all the other risks in the pay for success, I, you know, that's, that's an easier one to sell to my credit committee than the others. Great. I want to make sure we get Bill into the conversation. I think we've heard from all these different perspectives about how to set up these contracts, how to finance them. At the end of the day, this is about finding those programs that work and giving those programs the resources they need to hit results. So pay for success is trying to help resources follow results. And that, you know, with that can't be done without the service providers and without the intervention. So in some ways, the most important part of the pay for success social impact bond transaction is the intervention. Whether or not they'll be able to hit that impact, whether or not they'll be able to implement and actually change the lives of people they're trying to serve. So Bill, could you talk to us about your role, your organization's role with pay for success and what you found to be challenging? Sure. Um, so for those who don't know, I'm with the Center for Employment Opportunities. We are the, the vendor in the New York State deal. Um, and we provide employment services exclusively to people on, par on parole and probation. Uh, we have a very specific model and serve a very specific population and have been doing so for quite a while. And I would say that we really approach this as a, a solution first effort in that we were going to do the work that we were going to do regardless of whether or not pay for success existed. And, however, the, the goal, the outcomes we seek to achieve were very well suited to a, a model like pay for success for support and then that would allow us to achieve some additional, um, some additional improvements in, in our program. Um, in particular, where we, what we have seen in New York State that has been most encouraging is that both CEO and the New York Corrections have, have, are both invest, highly invested in the outcomes of this project due to its high profile nature. As a result, we have seen on the recruitment side of things that we are working hand in hand with the parole department to identify those participants that are high risk, that are close to release, that seem to do best in our program. This has long been a, an aspirational goal of us as an organization, and that this, it is, this, this funding mechanism has essentially driven us to that, this programmatic end that was very much unanticipated. And, and I think that the, that comes with it a lot of oversight, a tremendous amount of attention to detail, um, and you know, monitoring these things in every way, but it took CEO 
20 some years to get to the, to the point where we had the, capa the internal capacity to be able to handle that. And in, in, that includes a three year random assignment evaluation. And so we were very confident in our ability to have the impact and are, are now actually working out here in California through an award with the, through the James Irvine Foundation to explore what this might look like, whether this is possible in San Diego County. And I think it's going to be a very sort of interesting organizational experience for us to see how our sort of well-established, long, long track record in New York City and that project, how does this model function in a, in a newer, younger site that's only got a couple of years, does not have the scale, and therefore the, the sort of impact potential that, um, that our New York deal does. What's the, what's most different or what's the hardest part about working under a pay for success contract versus another government contract? Well, I think that the, 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 the biggest challenge is they, the, the, the sort of attention to detail and the, the high profile nature of it that e at each step your commitment to is not just to your to, to the government, but it's to, 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 the, to the various investors, it's to the intermediary, and that your, your concern, you're managing all of these, um, these different parties that are highly vested in what's happening, um, and, and over a very finite set of outcomes, and in particular, bed days inside of a correctional institution. And so being, putting that much weight and effort behind it does require, um, even, f even beyond what CEO is already capable of, I think we're, 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 we're devoting a lot more, um, more attention to this project, and so it's just operationally more burdensome. And I'm curious, say you meet a, non, a California nonprofit here at SOCAP, and they say, well, what are you working on? And you say, pay for success, and they say, that sound, I've heard about that, we totally want to do it. How would you, what advice would you give to them? Or what would you say if they are, if, <laughs> as they're all excited? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think for us, uh, and this is where I think this, this, this exploration in San Diego is going to be really interesting. You know, I, I do not believe that these are right for everything. Um, and I think it would be very wise to, we, we, we led with our intervention. We were, we were not doing, we were not, you know, becoming some sort of contortionist to, to fit ourselves into this model. Um, it, we ha all we had to do was run our program the way we know how to run it, and we believe that that would achieve the outcomes that, that would suffice the, the investment. And so I think the, any, making it simple and clear uh, that what, the, what the goal is. Um, when the New York deal started, I, as I understand it, there were a, a, a number of providers that could have potentially been involved, and it all sort of winnowed down to, 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 to one vendor, and, um, and clarity and simplicity seems to be the goal. Uh, I think there's, there's other forms of capital out there that may well enable an or, uh, a, a nonprofit to achieve its same you know, impact on, on the community without having to go through this particular mechanism. And that's something we're gonna take very seriously as we explore San, San Diego. You know, I, I just wanna point out too, part of the investment that we made up front was to really uh, improve the capacity of our provider network in Santa Clara County because when we introduced this concept, I mean, Carol, Caroline and I met with providers. They're very nervous about this because they're not used to operating, you know, uh, on a pay for performance type of basis. So there's there's a lot of nervousness. Um, there's a lot of those providers that we really question if they have the sophistication in order to be successful in this model. So part of our investment is to really help increase capacity um, in those areas. In our homeless project, for instance, we're requiring the lead agency to, to, to be Medi-Cal capable, uh, and that's not something that all of our providers are. So it really limited the number of providers who, would, who even bid on this particular project. And so the, I think what we're seeing is that we need to invest in our community-based organization community in order to help them become ready to do this if we're gonna expand this as we want to. So I think that that's, that's something that is really important because you know these providers are also gonna be looked at by the investors. They have to be pass their due diligence. You know, they have to prove their fiscal solvency. All of these are issues that you have to be aware of. Last question. Oh, for, yeah, I, was gonna, I just want to add, I think one of the things we've heard from the providers that um, we've worked with that I think is something that is very important is um, that by putting in place this pay-for-success structure, by bringing investors to the table, 
um, and having everybody focus on the outcome, that that has, over the course of the projects, served to reinforce stronger performance and more driving towards outcomes. And so that's one of the things that I think is, um, aside from can we scale this, are social impact bonds going to solve the world's problems, et cetera, um, I do think that there's a part of it that is around supporting performance management and, you know, to your point, helping organizations build that capacity. As you said, it gets everybody to the table because we've, we're all in this together. That is incredibly powerful. And what we've heard sometimes from our project partners is, hey, can you give a call to that government official? Because when I call, I'm just that social service agency, but when you, you call, you know, that's Goldman Sachs and that's a different level of call. And that can be really helpful to the project in the, on the ground. So we view from a sort of social impact perspective, the focus on outcomes as being really, really positive to the better management. So before we open it up for questions, want one last comment. Anybody can feel to jump, feel free to jump in. But obviously, you all have spent the number of hours spent on pay for success and social impact bonds in this room. We're not way more than the legal hours, though that's already <laughs> out, incredible and outstanding. Um, why do you all keep at it? Why keep at this social impact bond work? And if we are, you know, what are you hoping and what needs to be done to make this an enduring option for government contracting? Well, I think Andy said one of the primary reasons if we can get our service providers to focus on outcomes, huge. If we can get governments to focus on outcomes, huge. If we get governments to know what they are actually paying for, real benefit to taxpayers. Um, so that's all, you know, all the really aspirational stuff. So we often talk about at Living Cities are the positive externalities that we're seeing. Um, a lot of them have to do with government intervention, I mean, government um, innovation. The, um, the fact that CEO is now working closely with the government departments who touch their population huge. The fact in Massachusetts that probation and parole systems are actually now talking to each other, oh my God. In, in Cuyahoga County, that the homelessness system will talk to the uh, child welfare system. These are amazing, amazing outcomes. Even before we get to how many, you know, how much have we reduced recidivism? Um, so the, the efficiencies through our whole social economy are, are really too, too vast to give up on this. So I think for me personally, um, it's two things. It's one that 10 years ago, um, I was spending my life actually managing large-scale pay-for-success contracts around workforce development. And what I saw was exactly what we're seeing here, which is we got to better outcomes. We were able to have more of an impact on the people that were, we were serving through the program. So that, I think, is really, really important. I think the other piece of it, so that's really the pay for success side. The other piece of it is bringing private capital to the table. And um, we often get accused of, well, why would we, why do we want to leverage private capital? Government should just pay for all of this. Yeah, I am right there with all of you who say that, but that is not the world we live in. Right? If government wanted to keep doing it through pay for success and there was a way to bridge the risk to the nonprofits, I'm all for it. But we're in a time when the needs are greater than what government is willing to do, let's be honest, and what philanthropy can do alone. And so by using the tool of private capital to just for leverage, right? And when you look at the deals we've done, you know, you'll see in Massachusetts, um, through Living Cities and others, there's $3 million of subordinate capital, and Goldman invested $9 million. The private capital can help you scale, and that's a good thing. And so I think those two things together really have some power in the time right now. Um, I, I guess I, the only thing I would take issue with there, I don't think it's a, a question of willing. I mean, we're, the government is willing. An elected I th government. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Elected government. Okay. Uh, I already said they're you. willing I'm, to. I'm, I'm I mean, moving to Santa Clara. Okay. Um, <laughs> It, you know, we're, we're at a time where resources, for whatever reason, you know, obviously uh, everybody has a different view of those reasons, where resources aren't adequate to meet the needs. Um, and, you know, the cost of a unit of service continues to go up, um, and it's, it's a real difficulty. I mean, in Santa Clara County, our budget's $4.5 billion. And I can tell you the challenge of trying to manage that is significant. So if there's a mechanism that can help us move in the direction of really creating uh, sort of an approach that's, that's more focused on objective uh, data and outcomes, it, I just think creates the opportunity for a more successful government. And so, you know, if, if that vehicle, whatever the vehicle is, and in this case, I think pay for success really is, is one of those vehicles, I think it's, it's worth taking the time, uh, you know, to, to implement these things to see if they actually can, can provide uh, the, the benefits that we think they can. Uh, the additional capital is, is going to make a big difference, uh, I know, for us, and I think it can for others. So for those reasons, it's something that I, I really am committed to, and I, and I think that uh, it, it really has a great chance for success. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would sort of echo what's, what's been said here already. That for us, it's, it's it, it drives us as an organization in ways that we want to go, um, and it, it it pushes us to 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 be better at the one thing that we do, um, and and so I I think the the appeal of of it for us is also just to be very frank. There's not a lot of places to get this kind of unrestricted, flexible funding, um, especially at this scale. Uh, and I think that that is a, um, a tremendous benefit when you're trying to adapt and build a, a, a more a higher performing um, organization that you don't necessarily know what you're going to learn in the next month and how you may have to adapt. Uh, and so, I, so for us, I think this pushes us in ways that we're comfortable being pushed at the moment um, and, and without extend, overextending us. And I think that finding that sweet spot is really where I, I see this as having a lot of value. Thank you, Bill. And thank you all for talking with each other as well as the audience, so we're not just talking heads. Um, would love to open it up for questions. Any particular thoughts? Yes. And please wait. This session is being recorded, so please wait for the um, microphone to speak. There was a recent article in the Chronicle that um, said that San Francisco has spent $165 million a year for the past 10 years to uh, community-based organizations to address homelessness. I was on a civil grand jury committee that looked at the $500 million San Francisco allocates every year to um, community-based organizations. It seems we're ripe for this kind of solution. Um, and I'm wondering, here we are, SOCAP is here, all the innovation and so forth. Um, are, what are the prospects for us being able to tap this um, very innovative financial, financial tool to address some of our problems? It seems we, we certainly have the money. My advice to you would be, and or let me back up for a second. I think when uh, when we think about a social impact bond opportunity, and as you can imagine, we get lots of calls from nonprofits and folks in government. The thing that I always say is, you need three things: you need an intervention that works and providers that can deliver the service. Um, you need an investor, um, and I always joke that you're talking to me, so you got that one. And um, you need government that's ready and willing to do business differently. Um, so really it has to do with how the city is really thinking about delivering those services. On a really practical level, my advice would be to call your uh, friend here in Santa Clara County who spent a lot of time thinking about how you can structure pay for success around homelessness and learn from how they've done it. Because it really is, a, it's a new way of thinking about contracting. It's what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve and what are you willing to pay to achieve those outcomes? Because to your point, you're spending the money anyway. And then um, 
uh, what are you using to trigger that payment? In a lot of cases, what's being used are randomized controlled trials. My personal opinion is that's a pretty clunky mechanism. Um, maybe what you can do is define who's at risk at the outset, and there are payments based on sort of amount of time out of shelter or amount of time until they transition. Um, but I think that's the, that's the real work that needs to be done. But I certainly encourage you to piggyback. You know, I, I think a key a key issue, obviously, is is to find a champion. You know, with a political champion. I mean, that really was the way it got started, and we picked it up because I think we recognize the value. But, you know, San Francisco obviously has. You know, I I, I think that we actually have more homeless in Santa Clara County. Obviously, it's not as condensed. Uh, so there's a variety of issues, and, and, and quite frankly, homelessness is a very difficult problem. I mean, you know, when you think about who is homeless, and you think about the veterans, and you think about, you know, what are called 290s or sex offenders, the difficulty in actually finding places for these people to live is a very significant challenge. And it really takes a lot of people working together, you know, to figure it out. And if, if you can find a mechanism or vehicle that gets people really excited about it, uh, it sort of moves the needle, if you will. I think that, that that's really what has to happen, and, and obviously easier said than done, but I think it has to start with, with uh, you know, the electeds really being willing you know, to be champions for, you know, for, for a concept like this and then using it as a mechanism to, to move everything forward. I think beautifully said, Gary and Andy. The only other thing I would add is that there are also, once you have a government champion and an investor champion, we've really seen a lot of philanthropists step up with this initial feasibility process to help get to these complex transactions and see if they are feasible. Bill mentioned the James Irvine Foundation and Nonprofit Finance Fund Initiative, which is funding um, their work in San Diego, the work in Santa Clara in part, as well as exploration in San Francisco to do this. The federal government just launched their first uh, solicitation from the Social Innovation Fund for pay for success projects to invest in feasibility and transactions. So the other piece of this that's promising is that we're seeing some dollars to not only have conversations with those champions, but move them from conversations to action um, to see if we can get to viable transactions. So it's good progress there. Um, in the back, last question. Uh, thank you for your leadership and innovation. We appreciate all the work that you do and the leadership you have demonstrated in making this path, paving the way for us, being the trailblazers. So my name is Liz Shepard. I uh, run a social venture in New Orleans, and we're exploring a feasibility study to do a social impact bond around growing manufacturing um, biz and sustainable business development. Um, and I, one of the things that you all mentioned is that when you do a, a social impact bond, people come around the table in a new way, in a much more committed way, and there's uh, a, a sense of collaboration and collective impact that is really new. Um, and I was wondering, what are the, some of the soft technology and the hard technology that you use to help make that collaboration easier? The hard technology might be data sharing. Are there, are there technology or, or databases or ways that you found to help share information across these multiple partners? Um, the soft technology is how do you build that trust? How do you, how do you, um, you know, build those relationships? And if you could speak to those two components of this collaboration, I'd really appreciate it. I, mean, I, I can certainly speak to the, the data sharing component. Um, I mean, that has been a, a huge uh, step forward for us in the New York State deal in that um, most corrections departments at this point uh, do some sort of risk needs assessment. Um, more often than not, that information is never, never leaves the department itself and actually arrives at the, um, the provider who, who meets people after they're released. Uh, we are now getting that information um, and are getting it in, in a way that is very useful and that we have access to the department um, directly. So that data sharing has been a huge step forward and, and frankly, in, in, it, it is a, a big step in the sense of starting to really do some more uh, client matching to need. So, but not everybody coming out of prison will be right for our program. And, but we know specifically which subset of those people are and being able to 
to identify it brings some some level of coherence not just to this project but to the system as a whole um, and I think that, that that there really is a lot to, to be said for that um, and the the trust that it, it, it that process in and of itself is engendering trust between us and the department I can speak to that a little bit too as an organization that tries to help government move and pull these deals together. Um, it's an exercise in project management for sure to bring one of these deals to close with all of these different parties. Um, and so the, a lot of the, the hard technology for some of the parties, data sharing agreements, you won't believe how long they take, right? Uh, especially if you want outside access to providers and others. Um, so investing in that and the legal processes starting early certainly um, make a difference. We've found that management tools like efforts to outcomes and others that track real-time progress and outcomes are very helpful for the providers as they're implementing the soft technology. No time like FaceTime, being in person to develop those relationships, to realize that you know we're in the business of trying to teach government a new way of doing things, and you need to be on the ground, on the phone, working with people to help them build that capacity, and, and to acknowledge, like Andy said earlier, you don't know what you don't know. And while we have a few proof points out there, a few examples, um, each each um, government entity needs to figure out how to do this process for themselves, and it may look a little different. And so being open and not dogmatic about one way of doing things has been really helpful. I think on the soft side, too, is being really clear of everybody's motivation for why they're at the table and, and recognizing that um, some people won't fit in the group and being willing to say, sorry, wrong motivation at this time. Um, in the Massachusetts transaction, it was amazing how I would say the shared commitment um, after the results for the young men involved was replicability of the transaction. We all knew the world was watching, and so we were all committed to making it the best transaction, not for ourselves, which you typically see in a real estate deal, but the best transaction for the world. You know, and I think, as I mentioned before, you know, one of the issues for us is the time it takes, and so for, for our organization to have third sector as really managing this effort on a full-time basis um, really has allowed us to make a lot of the progress because their relationships with funders, we've established a funders council to, to get feedback so that we could understand what they were interested in. So we have this ongoing uh, relationship building process in which we're having a dialogue to try to understand what's important to them because obviously funders aren't someone, uh, at least in this area, that the county has dealt with in, in a large part. And even in philanthropy, it, it's allowed us to, to, to develop some better relationships there as well. But, but I think importantly for, for government is, is to really, once it sets sort of the path, what's, once you get on that path, you have to sort of make a commitment, you have to follow through. And people have to see that you're serious and, uh, you know, there's no waffling. Uh, and and that's, that's really an important part of this. Any final comments from folks before we wrap up? All right, apologies we couldn't take more questions, but I think the panelists will stick around a little bit afterwards if you have others that weren't answered. Thank you all for attending this session, and we hope this valuable.